So, <laughs> perils of doing episodes about new and current episodic television shows with mystery plots that you're also doing freelance staff writing for other channels about is that sometimes the twists and spoilers of the actual multi-part television gets out ahead of your own multi-part episodes of your own stuff that you then have to do a substantial rewrite of. <laughs> So, I feel like the big episode 7, Here's a Thing That's Been Going On Unveiling on WandaVision, being really only about 4 or 5 days old as of this scheduled posting, means it's a little too early to talk about it out loud up front in the show proper, but because some of it does tie into what was already in the majority salvageable existing audio for today's show, and just to put a bow on all of this, I've got a few thoughts about it, so I'm gonna put it at the end after a warning so you can get the meat and potatoes of all of this up front if you still want to both get the most from all the rambling various things are weird business in this set of episodes, but you either haven't been able to and or are waiting to binge watch WandaVision and don't feel left out. Cool? Cool. Previously on WandaVision. When the Marvel Studios first started, the whole Marvel Inc. enterprise was still run by Isaac Ike Perlmutter, a major political backer of the Trump administration. It's widely reported that his presence behind the scenes was the reason many MCU actors and creators were openly talking up bailing. Disney Ultimate split the Marvel machinery in half, leaving Kevin Feige with complete creative control of the film side. Perlmutter was still able to exercise a measure of influence over Marvel publishing. Allegedly, Perlmutter and possibly certain sympathetic editors and executives under him got to be of the opinion that because Fox didn't want to play ball on their terms in regards to sharing the X-Men or Fantastic Four on the film side, Marvel shouldn't be publishing or promoting as many comics featuring the X-Men and mutant-related characters, and instead maybe even find another set of characters within the comics universe that they did own all the licensing rights to and elevate their profile as a potential mutant replacement that then could take off in the cinematic universe, the Inhumans. But more immediately, making Inhuman in general a replacement for mutant. In a storyline stretching roughly from the 2013 event series Infinity, Inhumanity, and then Civil War II and Inhumans vs. X-Men in 2016, a Terrigen Bomb spread the Inhuman changing power chemical stuff all over the Earth, causing what turns out to be a sizable population of seemingly ordinary humans suddenly gain inhuman powers, which they didn't even know they were supposed to have. This was the inciting incident for the comics origin of Kamala Khan, aka Miss Marvel. A compressed version of this was then subsequently translated into the second and third seasons of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. The supposed plan was for agents to do the groundwork while separate Inhumans movie introduced Black Bolt and Medusa and Lockjaw and all of those guys, all aligning with the comic side of thing, having set these characters up as the new, more prominent Marvel superpowered weirdo franchise overriding the boring old X-Men. Which, of course, is not what happened. Not a great plan. Yeah, so we don't have time to cover every bizarre turn that this all took, but suffice it to say, apart from Miss Marvel becoming a well-managed breakout character, all this setting up and rearranging in the comics didn't lead to much. Longtime fans were largely confused, put off, or outright resented the mutants and humans status quo shakeup. Very few of the new and humans titles picked up any real traction in terms of drawing new readers, and to be charitable, didn't really seem to have a ton of sincere energy behind them on the production side. And even before the hammer came down from above that officially severed Perlmutter and the TV comic side of Marvel from the MCU, a schism was already starting to open between the wider company and the TV staff who'd been hired with ties to Joss Whedon, who was going to exit the Marvel inner circle very soon, as things were coming undone for him behind the scenes after having directed the first two Avengers movies, in part for reasons that were not immediately clear until more recently. Yeah, so those rumored tie-ins and crossover beats between Phase 2 and Marvel TV, mostly Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and related, never really ended up playing out. Personally, I always felt that Admiral Akbar was the unsung hero, a strategic military man who led combat ops against the Empire. Is that how you see it, Phil? S.H.I.E.L.D. is the Empire and your ragtag group is the Rebels? I gave my life for it. Literally. On the TV end, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. quickly moved on into new storylines fixated on magic, robot space, and eventually time travel, and other stuff I might not be able to adequately encapsulate here. But I'm pretty sure he can. <laughs> just raises further questions. Letting the inhuman stuff move from the foreground to just one more part of the series rotating background mythology of Marvel stuff we're allowed to use because no one else is, and eventually the by now long delayed Inhumans movie instead became a TV miniseries, which, you know, isn't exactly terrible. I mean, they had some nice Hawaiian location shooting, the basic outline and series setup I thought were decent enough for what they were going for, the casting was definitely strong, I know everyone eventually figured out Anson Mount was a good actor when he started doing Pike in the new Star Trek shows, but he was also very good here, especially considering Black Bolt is a really difficult
difficult character to make work as an on-screen live-action concept, and they liked that they committed to having him speak in sign language the whole time. Lockjaw really worked, like the CGI would be slightly better in a theatrical feature, sure, but otherwise that was definitely Lockjaw, and speaking of committing to something, they kept that the Inhumans' main way of getting around is, okay, we need to teleport, everyone hug the giant doggy, so yeah. She told us there's an alien dog in there. I want to see an alien dog. The main place it suffered is that this is one of the go big or don't go at all gonzo Marvel properties, and they went more like, eh, that'll do, I guess, though you might get a kick out of the hem production design if you're at all nostalgic for that era of mid 90s syndicated sci fi where the future always looked like the interior of a gutted Toronto shopping mall. What was clear was that it was hobbled by a low production budget that had, we are making this because we have to make this because the rich guy who owns us says we have to make this and no other reason written all over it. Never. What if I told you there's a place where people have powers like us? What the? There was no follow-up, no plans for one, and the most recent thing that's happened related to it is that the series' long-dead Twitter account briefly came back to life to tweet out the trailer for The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, which means, who the hell knows. Back in the comics, the X-Men and mutants very quickly whisked back into regular prominence just as the pieces were getting ready to fall into place for the Disney-Fox deal, and in 2018, the decidedly downbeat miniseries Death of the Inhumans brought about exactly what the title describes in order to effectively drop those numbers back down to about where they were before Marvel tried to make them the next big thing. Uh, parenthetically, just to keep it simple and get it in here, Death of the Inhumans is basically the really, really dark payoff, coda, etc., to a lot of cosmic outer space business that had also been happening between the X-Men and Guardians of the Galaxy books that culminates with the Kree deciding to reclaim the Inhumans as the slave labor race they were originally created to be and sending a big scary guy named Vox to murder all the ones who wouldn't go quietly, which turns into a big genocidal war and almost everyone dies, gets exiled, scattered, lost, etc., presumably awaiting someone to come by and hit refresh again, but this time without the baggage of the boarded let's try and be the X-Men for a while thing ever coming up again. It's pretty damn grim, and the Inhumans has been extremely grim in the past, so that's saying something. All just in time for the Perlmutter regime to get its final sidelining, at least in terms of content control, as Disney finally said enough is enough and effectively put Marvel Studios boss Kevin Feige in charge of the entire Marvel company. Comics, television, movies, everything. Which, relevant to the movie side of things, means they can now do pretty much whatever they want with whoever they want, except with anyone from Spider-Man because that still needs movie-by-movie -movie negotiation with Sony until they sell the rights back or if someone buys Sony, in which case Disney apparently gets them back automatically automatically for free. Wait, seriously, f***ing really? That's how it for real works? Who the f*** at Sony agreed to that? <clears throat> anyway, the MCU can call anyone a mutant or an inhuman or any combination of the other stuff, declare any of the earlier Fox X-Men movies canonical if they want to, which apparently they're going to sort of do when they make Deadpool 3, maybe, you know, since it's Deadpool and if you screw anything up there you can just say it was a joke. Hell, if we're being technical, they can make any Fox thing canonical even if it wasn't a Marvel thing now. Like, if they decide aliens and predators are Marvel stuff, they are. If they decide to do a Star Wars crossover, they're gonna do a Star Wars crossover. And you know they're gonna do that, right? Oh, sure, it's gonna be in the comics first, but they're gonna do it. It's only a matter of time. Oh, I knew this day would come! Although, frankly, I thought it would have been a long time ago. But what does that mean for this ridiculous business in WandaVision? I mean, I assume we'll either find out this Friday or sometime between then and the last episode of the show. As I repeatedly stress, literally every kind of magic and fake science bullshit has been established as possible within this franchise, so it's a random imperfect duplicate manifesting from her subconscious who's just played by the X-Men actor as a gag for the fans. Wanda can't raise the dead, but she can yank the non-dead Fox timeline version of Pietro slash Peter in from across the multiverse, and she brought him to life from a DVD copy of X-Men Days of Future Past because they're all in TV land are all equally plausible theories here. Knowing that Marvel Studios' general policy is not to commit to anything significant on future films or storylines until they're actually shooting them, precisely so they don't run into problems like they did when briefly trying to make things line up for the fizzled out in humans push between the features and agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., 
I would severely doubt that it signals any kind of decision one way or another on what they're planning vis-a-vis -vis the X-Men. Rather, if Evan Peters does somehow end up playing the new or reimagined MCU Quicksilver going forward, there will be some hand wavy dialogue about multiverse doppelganger here and later in that next Spider-Man movie and then in Multiverse of Madness and the What If Anthology series, which, along with J.K. Simmons popping up at the end of Far From Home, will all serve as ways to acclimate audiences and core fans to the acceptability of bringing back well-liked actors to play newish versions of familiar characters without having to tie them to the baggage of old movie continuity. I passed the test. I will diminish and remain a comic book guy. Basically a way for the studio to say, look, we all know no one is going to be able to roll out and save the troubled kid character in a surprise post credit scene to this or that movie with all, hello, I'm Charles Xavier, welcome to my school for the gifted, with the same holy shit impact as Patrick Stewart will, so just get Patrick Stewart again and have him sit in the chair. I'm Patrick Stewart as a water bear. Patrick Stewart! Give Jackman his claws back for a movie, let him beat some people up with deep fake CGI like you did for Mark Hamill, let McKellen come back for at least a scene with Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver so he can have one good merchandise still for this role that doesn't have the Brian Singer or Brett Ratner asterisk on it. You might as well. Eventually, you're gonna hang up the claws and it's gonna make a lot of people very sad. Huh? But one day, your old pal Wade's gonna ask you to get back in the saddle again. And when he does, say yes. Oh, right. I do think there's probably going to be some mutants and humans or powered persons in general stuff spinning out of WandaVision, almost like an opposite inverse M-Day, aka the No More Mutants thing from House of M, partly because they've already been setting up that with the twins already having powers that are outside their mother's supposed control. Going through the barrier seems to have switched on something in Monica Rambeau. Agnes keeps making jokey references to an unseen husband character named Ralph, which, bet not all of you knew this, is actually the anglicized form of an Old English and Old Norse name that roughly translated into the famous wolf, and that could be a setup for a character named Jack Russell, the werewolf by night, who was a Coach Faratu's presence was discovered by the humans. He has been destroyed. Nubala, the mortal shall sin. I'm sorry, what did you say his name was? Coach Faratu. Coach Faratu. That was his real name. Like, his actual vampire name? No, no, no. His vampire name was Balak Alastain. What the f*** would he name himself after a famous vampire movie? Was he doing a bit? I do not know, your unholiness. Who was a big part of 1970s Marvel horror comics and has been rumored forever to be a supporting character in either Mahershala Ali's Blade reboot or in the Moon Knight series. And hey, since this is all taking place in New Jersey, which is where Miss Marvel lives, I wouldn't be at all surprised if her cinematic universe incarnation wasn't either a mutant or just not an inhuman, since it seems like that whole thing is on ice for a bit. I also feel like whatever is going on will have significantly more to do than people are assuming with the forthcoming events of not only that series, but also the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, since the outside world building here is all about S.W.O.R.D., the Sentient Weapon Observation Response Division, and that series looks to be doing a lot more stuff related to covert government programs, and we already know Wyatt Russell is playing John Walker, aka U.S. Agent, to the throne of Captain America, so we're in military-backed super soldier territory again, and speaking of military super soldiers, the Abomination is apparently coming back for the She-Hulk show, and speaking of him, General Ross is involved in the Black Widow movie, so maybe that's a TikTok on Thunderbolts and or Dark Avengers being in the cards like I've been saying for three years now. You know, of course, if they're gonna do Thunderbolts or Dark Avengers, especially in a post-Civil War context, I feel like there's someone missing they're gonna need to go get first. You know, I'm something of a scientist myself. Bingo. Oh, and did I mention that another reason for Jack Russell to be lurking around somewhere, possibly recast as this guy named Ralph, is that while originally introduced as just a regular-ass werewolf, because you'd think that would be special enough, his origins and family history were later retconned to be connected to Wanda and Pietro, really, via association to a guy called the High Evolutionary. Now, his whole thing is that he does mad science and turns animals into animal people, like some Dr. Moreau shit. Look at yourself. I understand that I must be shocking to you. Look at him! Father, I must ask a question. Please. What am I? His main connection is that he lives on the same mountain they originally come from in the comics, and his experiments created Bova. That's the cow woman, who was the twins' nursemaid when they were babies, and who has already been referenced in at least one WandaVision Easter egg, so, hey, how about that? Also, his real name is Herb. Yeah, really? Power Armored Master of Forbidden Science and the Black Arts? Lord High Evolutionary of Wundagore Mountain? Creator of the New Men? Herb. So, probably not, but maybe, I guess?
Anyway, the High Evolutionary did it is one of the other ways various people in Marvel have gotten powers or been retconned to have gotten their powers over the years, particularly people who have animal nicknames, like uh, apparently at one point this was going to be where Wolverine came from, i.e. he'd just be an actual Wolverine evolved into a Wolverine-shaped person who forgot about that. I think I kind of like that version better, actually. And the reason he can do this stuff is connected after a bunch of retcons back to the Kree, the Celestials, and the Eternals, just like with the Inhumans and the Mutants, so it's entirely possible that whatever Evan Peters being on the other side of that door is actually going to end up paying off as won't be fully comprehensible or even decided upon until this coming November when the Eternals movie is supposed to come out. Which, you know, is always ultimately the insummation takeaway from these partially speculative episodes. Hope you enjoyed the verbal walking tour of literalized comics are weird history packed in among the cracks because otherwise this is all pop fiction realized as consumer entertainment on serialized scheduling means we don't know anything until we know something, and it's not really possible to be ahead of the game because the degree to which there's an actual game to be ahead of in the first place is an illusion of marketing, and as amusing as it can be, it's helpful to pull back and recall that. Moreover, I'd say it's important to not let that become the only investment that you have in stuff like that, even if it's still a substantial part of it, which there's nothing wrong with. Lots of people like picking things apart and keeping track of the pieces. But nothing undoes serial fiction with a strong fan base more consistently than when the back-and-forth gamesmanship starts to outweigh the desire to tell or be told a good story. I've seen too many things that start out strong, come apart when they get too invested in whether people are guessing their story turns or reading their own fan forums and start writing to outwit the hardcore audience instead of trying to tell the right story, ahem, and it just never works out well, ahem. Like, if nothing else, the big deal thing from last week's WandaVision was something a lot of people have been guessing before the show even aired, and I give the creators a ton of credit for not trying to rework it into some kind of red herring or change it in mid-production when this was still clearly the right decision for the story they set out to tell, even if a lot of people claim to see it coming. You didn't see that coming. You see, no matter what happens, I can almost guarantee you that however this series ends, a really prominent takeaway in the immediate aftermath is going to be that the ending somehow disappointed because it remains mainly about resolving its own storyline and the character arcs instead of turning into a checklist of setups for new cliffhangers and character origins for future MCU projects because that's what too many people think the only purpose of each new thing is now, and that's how you end up spoiling this stuff in very short order. Hello, Doctor. Did you tell the boy the truth about his father? Welcome to Prodigium, Mr. Morton. Luigi, Mario! Daisy! You gotta come with me, I need your help. What, what, what's wrong? You're never gonna believe this. So this time, maybe let's try not to. Instead, even if we don't get a Fantastic Four tease or an X-Men reveal or whatever the hell people are expecting, let's appreciate that we got interesting exploration of previously underdeveloped side characters, really fascinating new dimensions for Scarlet Witch, Vision, and several others, and this really cool, fun deconstruction of classic nostalgia TV. I mean, at least that's my perspective, for now. And alright, that concludes the non-spoiler portion. If you don't want to hear specifics about last week's episode of WandaVision, click away now, and I'll see you next time. I hope you had fun. The name's Agatha Harkness. Lovely to finally meet you, dear. Okay, bullet points. Agatha Harkness was Scarlet Witch's magic teacher and all-around mentor in the comics. Not necessarily evil, but definitely not de facto good, either. Seems like the MCU version is all the way bad, though. Is she behind everything? I doubt it. Wanda already admitted to enslaving the people and creating the hex around Westview in the first place for her whole revive vision, happily ever after sitcom fantasy, and it seems like Agatha turned up after that to cause trouble for her own reasons. Remember the Yo Magic commercial in the Halloween episode with the shark where the kid can't open the yogurt and wastes away? I'm thinking that was the clue. She's the shark, basically, the one who's been causing the plot developments and obstacles that forced Wanda to expend more and more of her powers so she can feed off of them and grow stronger herself, which probably has something to do with that ominous evil book in her dungeon, since the magic here is apparently color-coded and all of Agatha's magic, along with the energy in those vines growing in the cellar and all the flowers in her garden, have been purple, whereas the energy coming out of the book is red, i.e. the color of Wanda's magic. Uh, regarding the purple flowers and vines, the 2013 Vision comic introduced this plant called a Wundagore Everbloom associated with Agatha that supposedly gives you magic future-seeing powers if you trick someone into eating it and then kill them so you can cut it out and eat it again yourself. Yikes. So at least they want fans to think Tommy and Billy are 
are already dead if they catch this reference, and maybe they are, but more immediately on this PG-rated Disney television show. You're, you're asking if they've ever done a Sesame Street in which the Count kills somebody and then sucks their blood for sustenance. Yeah. No, they've never done that. On the subject of Agatha's flowers corresponding to her magic signature color, yes, in case you're wondering, it is also the case that Wanda's house grows only red and pink flowers. <laughs> and fans who've been watching since the beginning probably remember that back in the first two black and white episodes, we were informed that Dottie Jones is also all about her roses, which in this same episode, we can now see for the first time in color are yellow. Now. Is there a yellow female magic user in the Marvel Comics universe who'd fit this flowers equals powers witchcraft color coding bill by any conceivable chance? Believe it or not, yeah, there is. Life well spent! Arcana. Full name, Arcana Jones. Yep, same last name. And they both have husbands named Phil. Oh, come on! Arcana is originally a member of Squadron Supreme, and this is officially way too long at this point, but anyone who knows the two relevant details about Squadron Supreme also knows that the more than passing resemblance to Zatanna is more than coincidental, and that her presence, or the presence of anyone from Squadron Supreme, in a story possibly launching a multiverse could portend very interesting things, possibly, maybe, or not. I'm confused. But for now, apparently it means that among the myriad ways WandaVision could possibly end, we can now add Rainbow Magical Girl Witches Duel between red, purple, and yellow spellcasters, I guess, maybe, as aesthetics and setups go. And once again, as noted before, I'm still much more interested in whether or not the ending continues to offer satisfying insight and exploration into the psyche of its characters than what sort of spectacle and continuity drops it has to deliver, though all of that does actually sound kind of cool. Either way, I guess we'll find out soon enough. I'm Bob, and hey, we did it! We got to the end of this one. That's the big picture. Yeah, holy shit.